hi everybody i'm robert wagner and hi i'm darren killand and uh welcome to uh our new series uh the security strategy show where we try to come up with strategies uh for all size companies but in particular companies that may have only an army of one or maybe one half uh for their security right uh, if you're tasked with doing the security stuff um, we're here for you, and uh, this will be part of a continuing series on advice to help uh, folks in that kind of situation. So for today, we're going to be talking about uh, the best five open source tools for creating a forensic disk image. But more than that, we're going to talk about why we would be talking about this in the first place, right? So Darian, um, uh, so the concept of a forensic disk image, there's a, there's a couple different things we can talk about uh, as far as this goes, right? Right. It's it's really part of a larger strategy that uh, teams may employ if they've been breached or there's a compromise. And uh, number one, you want to know more details about what happened, right? Yeah. Maybe you have questions about, well, how did the attacker get in to this particular system? Or um, how was the system compromised? Or right. even, you know, hey, what what sort of data did the attacker steal or modify? Yeah. Right, or and that could what be an insider as well, too. Right? I mean, it, it could be someone inside that you're suspicious about. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, more often than not, though, you know, forensic uh, analysis of of the system can be thorough, but it's also very time consuming. Right. Right. And it's usually something that you would employ if you wanted to potentially arm you know, a, an attorney or a litigator to, to potentially go after, you know, some sort of monetary damages against some third party that you could potentially identify. Sure. Uh, and to that end, the types of image images that you can acquire from a system can be, you know, what was the state of the hard drive at the time that the acquisition took place, yeah. uh, which is what we're talking about today. Right. Uh, and then another type of acquisition would be memory acquisition, which means what was the contents of the computer system's RAM at the time that the acquisition took place. And, and that's even a little harder to acquire. Um, we're, so we're going to cover that. Yeah, we're going to cover that in a separate cover. Um, so we're going to focus on the, the disk uh, imaging type right. types of technologies today. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and so you would use a different tool to do what's called a memory uh, dump for that memory acquisition you're talking about, right? Right. And even, you know, for much larger organizations, enterprises um, that are protecting critical networks, they might even actually record <laughs> partial or all of the network activity emanating to and from a given host or asset, which also is not yeah. in scope. This conversation, right, and that's a lot of data to store. Um, the uh, and you know the other thing about um, things like memory dumps and stuff like that is you know one of your biggest enemies is literally power. Too often when something goes bad uh, on a system, like you get ransomware or something like that, a lot of people's first instinct is to pull the plug, right? To literally turn it off. You know, you panic. Uh, so so that's another reason why we'll talk about memory dumps in a future talk. Um, but uh, but when might someone then need to create an image and what's uh, what's kind of the things to keep in mind uh, when they do this? Yeah, it's it's really about um, trying to understand what changed recently on a system uh, and to get evidence of that in a way that can be potentially provable in court. Sure. Um, that's why you know, using specialized tools to do this rather than, um, you know, garden variety commands or, um, you know, seat of the pan type of, of oh, right. tactics is not going to be um, ideal in this scenario. Yeah, Apple uh, Time Machine is not going to be a very forensically admissible uh, piece of evidence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so a lot of times, um, you know, heavy forensics is usually based off of some sort of uh, litigation, either yep. civil, criminal, uh, and that's the motivating factor as to why you would need to acquire this, this data in this way to present it as court admissible evidence. Um, in those cases, 
generally speaking, if you're a small or medium sized business, you're probably working with a third party forensics firm that's doing a lot of the analysis, in which right. case they're going to need your help <laughs> to yeah. gather the information that they're ultimately going to analyze. And a lot of people think that this is just, okay, give me the system in question that we want to we want to interrogate. Um, and that could be valid in, in some cases, but keep in mind what a forensic investigator is going to want to be able to do is to figure out what's unique about this system. Like what's unique about the hard drive on this mm -hmm. system that would be a finding of sorts. And in order to figure out what's unique, um, a good investigator needs a reference point of, well, what's normal look like? Right? Oh, right. <laughs> so your golden image, if you've got one, right? It, absolutely. That's why, you know, if you're going down this path, um, it's, you're, you're almost uh, encouraged to take an image of a system that you know has not been tampered with, you know, that's mm. clean, um, that is a replica of what your standard, you know, endpoint or server um, that you're going to be, you know, doing any sort of heavy investigations against. So that way you have a good idea of what normal looks like. That way it's easier for the investigator to spot outliers. If you don't have that and you're doing this after the fact, it's going to take the investigator a lot more time to figure out what, what normal looks like. And for, for companies also, I should point out, um, if you ever get uh, you know, approached by an attorney who wants you to do e-discovery, um, forensics images uh, is uh, often part of what they're going to be asking for in e-discovery. And if that happens, then we're definitely talking, if you don't have a security staff, well, you're almost definitely talking about a third party. So for those companies that are out there that really are going to depend on a third party in general, for some sort of forensic forensicing, uh, forensic image creation, I should say. Um, one of the things that I think would be uh, useful, even if you don't have a security staff, is to have one or two people on staff that can create a forensic image in a pinch, right? You're not gonna be doing the forensics yourself. You're not gonna do the analysis, but so often time is of the essence when we're talking about a forensic image, things can change between the time you call your third party incident response person and the time that they can get on the site or gain access to the system. Yeah, it used to be that uh, before the, the days of, um, you know, heavy internet use, you could just you know, tell the operator, <laughs> hands off keyboard, walk away, and right. you know, <laughs> you can that image that way. Unfortunately, with everything being internet connected, it's um, more and more difficult to isolate or contain right. a system. Um, not only you know from any local access, but also from any remote access. Um, this is where a EDR technology can help. Uh, hmm. Many ER technologies do have features like network isolation or containment uh, that can help kind of um, make sure that minimal services are communicating out with the system before you acquire an image or have the ability to acquire an image. It's not perfect though. Right. Um, so you just have to go in with that, with that understanding. Yeah. So for smaller organizations out there, there, uh, be aware that many of the commercial uh, forensic imaging tools can be a little pricey, especially depending on, on how many licenses you need. Um, it's unlikely that many of you are going to deploy it across all of your, something like NCASE, which is probably the best well-known one, all across your systems, unless you've got some super valuable data. So what we've done is we've put together a, a, a list of uh, open source forensic Im imaging tools that you can use in this in a pinch kind of strategy. So the idea would go, you get one or two people just simply trained on how to use the tool. Now you may also want to think about whether or not those folks should also learn how to at least establish a chain of evidence. This is what allows this data to be court admissible. Now from that point, from the moment you basically lock it into evidence, that's when you're going to start handing it off to a third party if you don't have the resources for forensic um, analysis internal. But um, 
but we've put together this list of, uh, of uh, open source tools. And while we're, you know, the, the list will be posted below, but uh, Darian, which are the ones that you've had um, probably uh, the best experiences with? Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, some of the tools that um, are, are are listed down there are actually well understood and well <laughs> sure. well, well used for many years. We're, we're talking, you know, decades plus, which is crazy. oh yeah, FTK goes way back, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the the thing you have to kind of figure out with with these tools is first off, you know, what what is the predominant platform or operating systems that your organization uses and making right. sure that the uh, forensics tool supports the hard disk formats of those different platforms. Yep. So for example, if you're predominantly a Windows shop, um, you probably don't need an open source imaging tool that focuses just on Linux file system formats, right? Or- Right, or if you're predominantly a Mac OS or Apple shop, uh, you probably want to find an open source tool that is very familiar with and knows uh, the different Apple specific file system um, versions. Yep. Uh, another thing to think about as you're trying to choose an open source tool is how good you are at the command line versus how much you need a graphic interface. Things like Sleuth Kit. Um, uh, come uh, paired with um, some graphic interfaces that will make your life a little bit easier. Uh, Autopsy, I think it is, that uh, pairs with Sleuth, Sleuth Kit. Um, whereas some are pure command line. And you, uh, you probably want someone who's probably a little used to uh, Linux administration to run those sorts of tools for you. Yeah, and then the other aspect you want to try to figure out is um, what layer of imaging do you need? Right. Um, there are some, there are some uh, tools out there that focus on acquiring the disk image at the partition layer um, mm -hmm. versus other imaging um, tools that acquire the disk image almost at the raw at the raw layer, you know, before there's even a partition applied to it. So you can potentially acquire, um, disk information of Slack space that has not yet been partitioned potentially. Um, and that would be, you know, kind of in extreme circumstances where you have uh, evidence or reasonable doubt to believe that, you know, the adversary attempted to clean up or hide their activity, in which case acquiring a raw, like a raw low level image makes a lot more sense than simply sure. acquiring it at the partition level. Yep. Uh, and this is where you can collaborate with whoever you've uh, um, kind of put on retainer for third party uh, incident response, right? Whatever that company is, work with them. They probably have their own for, uh, preferred tools uh, anyway. So you can collaborate with those folks so that you can make sure that the handoff will be as easy as possible. Um, and they'll also be able to tell you how deep they suspect based on your needs, right? And if, if all we want to do is figure out if someone's been stealing data, you don't maybe need to go that deep. If we think that a you know, nation state has been attacking you, that Slack space uh, might actually be uh, necessary as well because that's a place people hide sometimes, so. Right, or even like in a ransomware compromise. Oh yeah. Uh, where you know you've got malicious code that's starting to delete critical files, um, and after they delete, well, in fact, they could encrypt the data and then delete the unencrypted data. Right. Uh, don't have a backup of that. Then your next best option would be to obtain a disk image of the raw of the raw disk. Yep. Uh, below the partition layer and then start to look for any recent deleted files as a way to recover this data potentially. Yeah, and, and good luck. You you might get some of it back, but don't hold your breath. Uh, so hopefully that gives everybody some good ideas around tools and strategies that they can use, even if you're not, uh, a, even if you don't have a full security shop with uh, all sorts of analysts and uh, forensic response folks and, and everything else. So this should at least get you started. There's plenty of YouTube videos, by the way, on how to use these tools out there just to get you started. 
I recommend you practice before you need it because yeah. the, the, right, the last thing you want is to have to figure this out in the middle of an incident. So yeah, there's there's plenty of uh, tutorials out there online for each one of these tools that describe you know hey what's the general process for acquiring the disk image how did, how does that work. Um, this can be a great exercise for the key members that need to be aware of this process right to on. just go through and, you know, um, modify a couple of files on a test system, acquire the image after the fact, and then, you know, as an exercise, see if they can identify what the changes that were made to the system looked like. Cool. Um, well, this has been valuable, valuable insight. Uh, Darren, thanks so much for spending some time uh, to, to give folks a, a, a little advice out there. Um, hopefully, we've helped everybody out a little bit. Um, again, this is all powered by Fletch. Uh, so if you're looking for a, a, a way to kind of get ahead of threats um, that are coming out in the world and see if they impact you, uh, we have a very cool trending threat app. It's free to try. Uh, and you can get to it uh, via the QR code or the bit.ly link here on the slide. And with that, have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>